Welcome to the Planner Pals podcast, a podcast with two true Planner Pals. My name is Mark, or Mark Your Pages. And I am Jess, or Jessie Corinne, and I knew when Mark approached me about doing this podcast that this topic was going to come up eventually. Did I expect it to be as soon as it is? No. But today, yes, we are talking about fountain pens, and if the title didn't already give it away, one of us is an extreme lover and the other one might be a hater. I'm so excited for this podcast. You don't, I would would say you don't have an idea. I think everyone knows and has an idea about it because this is like one of my favorite topics. And I love the fact that you are like not into it Because I think that's like the best conversation to have. It's like when you talk to somebody about planning for the first time and they're like, I don't get it. You're like, grab a seat, my friend, and a notebook and a pen. We're going to have some fun today. So we're going to have some fun today. We'll see about that. We'll see if you can convince me that this is a good idea. Because right now, I'm not convinced. Well, before we get into our topic today, we just want to take a moment and thank all of the listeners, our commenters over on YouTube, on Spotify as well, and just everywhere. Last episode, we know it was a long one, but thank you all for listening through. It was such a great conversation, and we had such amazing comments from that as well. Jess, I'll tell you, I think the biggest things that I saw, I'm curious like if you saw the same things are different. I think perfectionism was the one that a lot of people said, like that's what's holding me back the most or has held me back in the past with planning. Um, did you see anything else on that that you felt like was a, a hot topic? No, I think that that one really was the big one, and I really like the fact that people highlighted like it's not just perfectionism in the sense of, oh, I'm going to share this on social media I want it to look a certain way but it's also just for like own personal enjoyment in terms of journaling like oh I don't want to write this down if my handwriting looks bad or oh I put a sticker for people who use stickers in the wrong place and now my spread is ruined kind of a thing so it's nice to know that all of our planet pals we're all in this together and we can kind of share in that fact that sometimes perfectionism does hold us back I'll say that the other thing that I saw is a lot of people that shared their approach to planning and that a lot of them are bullet journaling And we talked about this when someone tells you like, you're not bullet journaling if they're like, look, I just don't use these things. They don't make sense to me. Therefore, I don't use them. They would cause more mental anguish than they are providing, which I can very much respect. Yeah. And I think it's also because uh, a lot of our community, or at least a decent chunk of it, they're not beginners anymore, right? They've they've gone through the ringer. They know what works and doesn't work for them in terms of their bullet journaling practice. So it has evolved to a point where it does look distinctly different from the original method. And I think that that's actually a very valuable thing. That's a good thing. We want you guys to be planning in ways that actually work for you. Yeah. And that's a really great segue, Jess, into today's topic, because I feel like fountain pens are the evolution with writing, especially with an analog system. Not saying that everyone has to use one, but I've personally gotten a lot of enjoyment out of it. I found communities of people who have as well. And if it wasn't for bullet journaling, I can say that I would have honestly never been introduced to fountain pens, at least the way that I have. So let's start off first. I'm just curious, you know, let's just start from ground zero. Like, what do you know about fountain pens or even care to know about them? Oh, gosh, because I was kind of thinking about it before we started, I don't know, even musing on this episode, like what even is a fountain pen? And I know that sounds probably to some like a super dumb question, but I was trying to think of a way to explain it and I could not come up with any kind of satisfying answer. So in my mind, okay, a fountain pen well, it's a pen. That's a pretty good start. But good job, I always good job. think of it. Thank you. I tried here. <laughs> I always think of it in terms of that kind of like diamond shaped nib. So in my mind, I'm like, okay, it's got a diamond shaped nib. But then where does the fountain kind of come into it? So I feel like that has to be part of it. But I don't really understand how that relates. I don't know the full like background history. Like I'm not like a fountain pen historian by any means, right? I'm definitely a modern new age fountain pen user with a great appreciation. I would guess that the fountain kind of comes from like the idea of a fountain is continuously right pushing water out of it. And it's a similar way to think about fountain pens. A fountain pen is continuously feeding ink to your tip or your nib, right? The, your diamond pointy thing at the top of your pen so that you're continuously writing. It's you know an evolution from that classic dip pen that we see a lot in like history where they're you know writing with a ink and a quill. I mean, that's the original way that things were used. Eventually upgrading to dip pens with metal nibs, right? Calligraphy nibs or things like that that we're seeing a lot of now. Glass nibs are really cool, not for a fountain pen, but for dip pens as well. What I love about it is the different styles that you have when it comes to fountain pens. Definitely the inks. The inks to me are like the most fun because it's there's so many. There's so many different flavors, not 
taste flavors, but flavors visually. <laughs> Don't drink the ink. <laughs> Even if it smells like fruits, and there are some out there that have smells to them, don't drink the inks. I would just go to say like the main parts of your fountain pen really are going to be your nib. Now, not all of them are diamond and pointy. There are a lot of different types of ones out there and materials too. I know this is probably blowing your mind right now. Yeah, I like I okay. I the only ones I've seen have iridium stamped on it. So I was like, okay, it's iridium. Yeah. That probably means something to somebody, but then to think that there are ones out there that have like different metals, like in my mind, yes, it makes sense that not all fountain pens are going to be made from exactly the same stuff, but I haven't really given it a lot of thought, I suppose. There's some really fancy ones out there that are made out of gold because gold is very soft, right? In nature, even though it's like yeah. can be hard and writing with that is like ultra smooth, like gold nibs are like creme de la creme of niceness especially with smoothness of writing maybe that's what i need because yeah like pure gold it's kind of so malleable that you can crush it with your fingers type of a thing so to think of a pen nib being made out of gold kind of gives me a bit of a worry point like oh gosh i'm gonna like ruin my pen but i assume that you have like different degrees of i don't know gold percentage to actually make it so that you could write with it yeah but well also on top of that too i mean you can definitely damage the nibs of your pens um there are some terrible horror stories of people who where the pen rolls off the table falls nib down and just like destroys it and especially for some of these pens too um, there's a really cool one that i have called a vanishing point it's like a retractable pen but it is a fountain pen and that nib when you see that it's like well that's built into your pen like in a way you kind of have to buy a new pen or at least the new nib so on top of that as well you've got like the barrel right so that's kind of the outside of it what looks so very cool the different styles different materials Again, we'll talk all about that later because I've got some really cool favorites out there as well. Then you have like the pen cap. So multi-use pen caps as well. There are some out there that help keep your pen from drying out. I mean, honestly, that's the real purpose of the cap is to keep your pen from drying out. But some companies are actually building in technology, also known as plastic, into their cap to help. <laughs> you know, keep also it... known as plastic. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like fountain pen ink drying technology or whatever. And I'm like, you put plastic on the inside of your cap to keep it extra fresh. Let's, let's calm it down here. I like that idea of like the new and improved kind of thing. It's like you see it on a lot of different products. Like toothpaste is one that always comes to mind like how many improvements in toothpaste can we really make like i know they've got purple ones now like that was probably an improvement for some people but i don't know how much can we really improve on a fountain pen probably a lot please don't at me oh my gosh <laughs> Oh, be prepared for the fountain pen gatekeepers of Reddit. Like they're scary oh, no. people. Again, you have to, you appreciate what they know, but there's definitely areas where people who that make custom made pens are like, don't you dare buy that commercial crap. And other people who are like, well, I can't afford a $200 custom made pen. I'm going to get this one for $6. Yeah. I mean, even just hearing you talk about these kind of initial things, it's, I, I kind of appreciate in a way, like being so new to this and not really knowing what's going on and like all of the jargon and stuff like this. That's how people probably feel coming into things that like I'm an expert in, like, you know, bullet journaling. And if you're kind of getting into that for the first time, you know, what, what is a log? What What is the this daily, weekly, rapid logging, whatever else? It gives you an appreciation, I suppose, for like how a newbie looks at things especially in spaces that you're already quite familiar with so i i feel like this is still valuable for me even though i'm just like what <laughs> Yeah, well, I think the, if anything, the information will be good because if you haven't really been introduced to it before, or had a lot of experience with it. I mean, I was there at one point. There is new terminology you need to use. You will likely use it wrong. And people, for the most part, are very kind in correcting you and being like, well, that's not actually called this. I still do it now because when you say a cartridge and a converter, I exchange those words very often, but they mean two very different things. And we'll get into like terminology and what a converter versus a cartridge is and how to use it. I guess first, you know, I know you don't have a lot of experience. You have deemed yourself a fountain pen noob, but do you have any experience with either a fountain pen or even like dip pens or anything like that? Well, I guess it kind of shows how much experience I have because when you said dip pen, I was like, oh, that's a different thing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, well, yeah, it is a different thing. Well, theory, yes. <laughs> well, yeah, so that, I guess that's the thing. It's like when I think of fountain pens, along with the, the diamond-shaped tip, 
which now I've been told it doesn't even have to be diamond shaped. So way to ruin my day. But I, I always kind of thought that a dip pen was kind of the same thing. I kind of lump fountain pens in the same space as like, you know, dipping a feather into ink and like scratching it onto a page. <laughs> I don't, I do not think that that's what they're actually like, but those are the kind of things that come to mind. I know I must have at some point used a fountain pen. And when we floated the idea of this episode, I kind of went on like a, a mental hunt. Like when was possibly the first time that I used one? So when I was like 10 years old, something around there, now I can't tell you specifically, I got a calligraphy set. I do not know who from or why, but I was very excited about it. The idea of hand lettering was something that was very exciting to me. And I do think that it must have come with something similar to a fountain pen. It had the little plastic bottles that you like click into the pen, screw them around. Cartridges. Cartridges. Yeah. I was thinking, I'm like, I don't want to use it wrong because you just said the thing about the converter and I don't want the purists to come and get me. Please be, be kind. That was probably my first experience with a fountain pen, but it obviously didn't make too much of a lasting impression considering I can't really remember a lot beyond the fact that there was one bottle of purple ink and one bottle of red. And I remember putting the ink down to the paper, feeling very excited about it. And then my handwriting didn't look like it did in the calligraphy books and instantly gave up on it. When you're trying a new skill and there's that kind of like startup of like, you have to like kind of suck before you get good. I'm like, absolutely not. If I'm not a natural born talent, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> Well, I think a lot of people actually came across calligraphy pens, which are different than fountain pens, very similarly, because I was the same way. Now, I'm a lefty, so a lot of this stuff has never been sold to me ever. You know, like a lefty with a fountain pen or a calligraphy pen, you are a unicorn and not in a good way. You're poking someone with the horn and no one's going to like it and it's going to get messy. <laughs> So it is very much, I did the same thing. You see that you're like, oh, look at that beautiful script lettering and all of this. And you're like, all I have to do is just dip my pen into the ink or put the cartridge into the back of the pen and just start writing. And it's going to come out like magic. And it comes out like hot, stinky garbage. And it does that for a really, really, really long time. And sometimes if you have old ink, it will smell like old stinky garbage. So it really oh, is full circle. I know. And it's like, as an adult, I know that you do have to have that period of getting used to something. Like we're allowed to be learners. We're allowed to take time to learn new skills. But still, every time I embark on a new thing, and I know that fountain pens, if I ever get into them, are going to be like that. There's going to be that kind of suckage period. And I'm just going to hate every second of it. Well, the good thing about fountain pens, and this is the major difference between calligraphy pens and calligraphy nibs which are different too so like a fountain pen nib for the most part unless it's like a very flexible nib it's almost like writing with a regular pen there's really no difference you don't have to write in cursive you actually don't press down hard on a fountain pen really because with a calligraphy nib or even some of those other like dip ones the whole idea with like those thicks and the thins it was all about the pressure that you're pushing on the nib so with probably the calligraphy pen that you got I'm guessing when you press down, did the nib kind of like open up a little bit? Like, was it very flexible? You have literally just unlocked core memory right now because I do remember pressing down on it. I remember it being more rigid than I was expecting, but I was thinking like, oh, if I press down, I should get a thicker line. And I'm pretty sure I bent the tip open. It was like a little <laughs> spread eagle fountain, quote, fountain pen kind of nib. So yeah, I probably didn't do it any good things or any kind of service. It's probably user error, but... It happens with everyone. I think that's been something that scares a lot of people away from it because you hear fountain pen and ink and nibs and all of that. And you, I think your brain instantly goes to those calligraphy nibs. And what I've really found and what I've really loved about it, and I was in the same boat as you, so I don't want to say like I was born in the fountain pens. No, like this definitely was, I saw people using it. Christmas was coming. I mean, my very first fountain pen and my fountain pen I used, no lie, or had, I didn't say I used it for like two years, but I only had one for about two years. It was a Christmas gift from my sister-in-law. It was a Lamy. I knew nothing about it. I got it. I was like terrified. It really wasn't as scary as it can come across. So I think let's do this. This might be, would be a really good thing to do is what assumptions do you have about them? And then maybe I can like thumbs up or thumbs down them and see if that works out. Because I find this is like the best way to educate, ask stupid questions and I'm going to give you stupid, funny answers. Okay. So I guess like the first one would probably be that they are difficult to use. Cause I kind of think about them in terms of the pens that I typically use, which 
favorite would have to be Paper Mate Ink Joy. I know it's not the topic, but I love it and it deserves the shout out. And you're probably just like, okay, Jessica, yes, that's great. You're a $1 and 84 cent pen, such a you know high quality piece of equipment, but I love it. I could just pick it up and write with it. You know, click in the end, it's ready to go. I don't have to do anything. There's no startup cost. There's also no maintenance that goes with it like outside of maybe the end gets a little scungy and i wipe it off on a separate piece of paper i think with anything that's really nice especially with fountain pens yes there is kind of a startup where you have to put the ink into the pen and that honestly can take you less than 10 seconds to do so it isn't a very long process necessarily to kind of get it up and running and get into it and then once you have it with ink inside of it you write with it until the ink is gone the same way you would do with your ink joys as well eventually they will run out of ink and that's why you probably buy them in bulk right and you have (laughs) a pack of 20 or more you know off to the side and in a drawer (laughs) similar to what happens with a regular ink or gel pen as well as like the tip can get stuff on it, right? And you do the same thing. You just wipe it off and it's really kind of it. Now, it still will get extra inky, right? There's still maybe some of that goes on, but I I look at it very similar to any type of pen, unless it's like a fast drying gel pen. They have fast drying ink that you can put inside of your fountain pen. So like there's almost zero instance where you are smearing ink all over the place. Like I have a bunch of it because like I said, I'm a lefty and it just naturally just loves, ink loves my hand and it loves to push against the page and smear everywhere. But you also learn different ways to write to like make that happen or not happen. Yeah, I think that that would probably be the second assumption that they are messy because obviously you've got different ways to fill them. You've got the cartridges, but then you've also got the bottles. I've seen the bottles. They're beautiful. So I assume you must be getting the ink out of the bottle somehow. But I always would worry that I would make a bit of a mess trying to set them up and then use them. That is another one that's like a hard one. It can be messy, especially if you're doing it wrong. If you knock over a bottle of ink, which I have done multiple times, that is like the worst feeling ever in the entire world because it's multifaceted. One, you're like, oh, crap, there is ink everywhere all over my desk. Two, that ink cost money and you're like, what do I do? And you find a way to suck it up in some way. I've done that before as well. After I clean this up, how do I clean myself up? Because not only is that going to be covered, but like it touches your skin. It's there for a hot minute. But for the most part, there's actually not a whole lot of mess that needs to happen. I guess I can put it that way because a lot of the pens, especially some of my favorite ones, everything's kind of built into the pen. So we talked about cartridges before, which essentially is something you put into the top of your pen. And it's kind of like the same thing as like a ballpoint pen, right? Your ink is just kind of in that like very thin little cylinder. It's the same thing except this fountain pen ink you push it in you use it till it's gone and you throw the cartridge away now if you are frugal like me you try to refill those cartridges with ink because you're like i'm gonna make this last and then you're dealing with like ink syringes and pushing ink into little containers i'm like that's where that's where a mess can happen but for the most part though when you're dealing with just the ink bottle and you're dealing with kind of these other pieces so the other piece is called a converter and what a converter essentially is and there's a lot of different versions i'll talk about them later we'll get in deeper about the specifics in some cases you just stick the tip of your pen in the ink and you turn a little thing and it sucks the ink up and then you're done right and then your pen is filled with ink and you just go ahead and start using it until it's gone and then you just do the same thing again when you need to fill it with more ink well it's good to know that then if there is going to be mess it'll be a me problem problem rather than the pens problem. I mean, there are times too, and especially because there are so many different ink bottles as well. Like I know it's a little bit blurry, but I have all of mine set up here. One of my favorite parts about buying inks, aside from the inks itself, are actually the bottles. Like the bottles are so beautiful. Some of these that are out there, just they're pieces of art within themselves, right? It's kind of like perfume bottles, you know, like the ones that are always like super intricate or really cool. Or my wife has one that looks like a a high heel shoe, but it somehow holds perfume in it. But like those look really neat. And so it's something you want to display and have out, but it also serves a function by holding on to the thing that is the lifeblood of your fountain pen. The lifeblood of the fountain pen. I love that. <laughs> oh gosh. I'm sure that there is probably someone out there who is writing in an ink that is not an ink. <laughs> But oh, 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 gosh. Uh, <laughs> Don't get us started on that, Mark. Don't do it. <laughs> well, I mean, there are some really cool inks. There's one called like Oxblood that's really cool looking, but it's like very dark and ox bloody. Makes sense. Goes with the name. Actually, okay, side note. I've been watching these videos. They've been, ugh, the algorithm, it just gets you. You know when you watch something for too long and then the algorithm's like, oh, you obviously like this. We're just going to serve it to you again and again and again. 
The worst was, videos too. <laughs> I know, right? Because the best part about this one is that every like video that this guy makes is like five minutes long. So of course I watched the whole thing, which means that then I just get sucked into like a half hour to two hour loop of just watching all of this guy's stuff. But he does like traditional art forms. So he's out there like grinding stones down to make inks to put in his like homemade printing press. It's so freaking cool. Absolutely could not take the time to do anything like that. I it makes me very much appreciate how much easier it is to just have access to pens and inks and stuff, even if they're fountain pens and you have to fill them up yourself. In the same way, when you see some of those things being made, and I think even when you use some of them as well, you really appreciate it. And something in relation to like fountain pens is I've gotten to know some people that hand make fountain pens and they are, you know, grinding down materials. They're, some of them are whittling things. Some of them are casting. I mean, it is such an art form inside of that that you really do start to really appreciate not just what it can do and how that tool helps you, but like what goes into making that tool. Yeah, I will say that even though I am still a little bit of a fountain pen hater, we'll see if you can convince me, I do appreciate the craftsmanship. Like I think that there is a lot to be said about how pretty the pens are, also the inks, and then being able to kind of like display and store them. Like I can understand why people would very easily fall into a kind of collection space. Like with any crafting hobby, the collection is a hobby as well as the use. Everything that I have, I can say, though, is a pen to use, not necessarily a display piece. While I do display them because some of them are beautiful or I have two pens specifically that I like, they are beautiful. I don't ever want to use them. I will use them, but I didn't want to. And it just looks so nice. But I think what's cool, at least about my collection, is that I could take any of these pens out fill it with ink at any point. And I don't have to use it the whole time. I'm a really big proponent of, you know, if you want to switch pens, especially if you have a collection like I do, which is probably small compared to some others, you can just empty out that ink, give it a quick little clean, store it away and pick out your next pen and fill it up and go. And you can do all of that in, you know, under 10 minutes. Yeah, as I said, I can really appreciate the artistry of it. Like, inks, pens, they're all very pretty. But then I think that I guess another assumption that would come with that is that because you're getting something that is probably better quality, possibly, that there is going to be a larger cost associated with it. As said, the pens that I use, they're like $1.84 per pen. And that's if you get like the expensive set. <laughs> so the idea of spending more than like $5 on a pen is like ludicrous to me. Even when I buy a Tombow, in my country, a Tombow is like $8 New Zealand, which I think is like $5 US or something. Mm -hmm. That feels like too much to me. Like, absolutely not. Can't spend more than that on a pen. <laughs> I feel you on that. And that's how I felt early on. But I think as I started to use them more and appreciate them more, I've definitely upped my personal budget for them. So like a pen that I'm using right now is by Platinum and it's called the Preppy. And this pen costs about $5. There are some that are less expensive. I actually went to, there's a store in the US called Five and Below, which is like the dollar store, but it's $5 and below uh, instead of $1 and below. And I was in there one day and they had a set of two fountain pens for five dollars so technically you can get them for even less they don't have to be expensive they can though and that really goes down when we were talking earlier about like the materials the nibs like when you're getting a 24 karat gold nib for instance more than likely that is in a titanium bodied pen and you're dealing with like higher quality materials or if it's being handmade even if it's in something like resin or a resin block and it's being ground down or trimmed down i don't know the right word for it that that's someone's time that goes into that. And that kind of ups the cost as well. I'm somewhat frugal with the pens that I'm buying. So I usually was sticking inside of that lower cost area. The most expensive pen that I've purchased on my own was $65. And that was like kind of a limited edition. I had to have it. It was super cool. It was a, it's a Twisby. Twisby is one of the names of the brands that I actually really love. And it is the whole fountain pen community's fault for getting me into those because they are like fountain pen snacks because you get one and you're like, oh, I love this color. It's so nice. And then it's like, okay, now we're coming out with this 
uh, Sunset Limited Edition version, you're like, but I love this yellow color. Like, that's made out of, like, premium materials. And then they're like, hey, we're going to introduce you to rose gold and something else. And you're like, but I have to have that one, too. And then it kind of continues on. But it's because I really like the pens, and they look really nice. But I will say, so the most expensive pen I have in my collection is from Waldman. And it is. It's made out of titanium. It's, like, German-made steel nibs. And that pen's retail cost is $440. Oh, my God. No, it was gifted to me. So I didn't pay for that. But let me tell you something about it. While I appreciate the artistry and the materiality of it, I actually made a video about this where I tested my very inexpensive. Actually, I used my five and below pens and I used the $450 pen. And I'm going to tell you, there was not a lot of difference in how it wrote. I love an underdog story. Good job, $5 pen, you go you. But that is so many plates of sushi, oh my gosh. (laughs) It is a lot. I think over time too, I mean, I definitely can come to appreciate it, but I have my times too where I'm like, I really like the way that pen looks, but I'm like, I don't know if I could spend $220 on that. So like that's when you become an affiliate with a stationary pen company and you get store credit or, you know, you kind of work through that. And I do believe that you can have too many. I think if you're not really going to use them a lot or all of them, it can get into a weird spot. But I think if you're buying pens, especially if you have like one or two good pens, I personally think it's worth the investment. And I can share with you some of my favorite uh, towards the end of the episode. We'll go through that because I also want to like recommend some for you, Jess, as a new, but also if other people are listening that are interested in getting into it. You know, I've been around the block for like a second. I haven't been around as long as some other people have, but I think I've got some good picks for you. Well, I look forward to hearing them because if you can, if you can convince me that it's a good idea and if you can, you know, recommend me one that doesn't sound like a $400 pen, <laughs> then I might. <laughs> Emphasis on might. I might might get one. We'll see. No promises. I know that you're a big fan of the rainbow. There are a number of pens that are iridescent rainbow. I mean, we can get you into it because I know your personality. And that's one of the things I love about fountain pens is like, you can literally reflect your personality with the pen that you use. And it doesn't have to be an ink joy. What? My ink joy? It's okay. He didn't he didn't mean it, baby. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, personally, not my favorite uh, non-fountain pen, but you know, whatever you do, you boo. Yeah, no, I have so many different black pens because I feel like anytime I do a pen test in a journal, I want to show like all of them, even though like if one of them doesn't ghost, most of them don't ghost, but it's good to show, yes, your specific pen that you like to use, dear viewer, it works in this notebook. I think that one of the best assumptions I have about it, and I hope that it's correct because I feel like this is like a benefit a true benefit of using a fountain pen is that they would be more environmentally friendly. Like every time I use my my poor baby Inkjoy, when he starts to get to the end of his days, Requiem Scat and Pache, I do try to get every last drop of ink out of that because I don't feel good throwing them away. Uh, so I would expect that a fountain pen would be a little bit better for the environment, hopefully. Yeah, I definitely think that that is a big benefit. And a number of our listeners actually commented when we asked them about like, what questions do you have? Or what would you want to know or let Jess know about this is that they can be better for the environment. The thing is, is that there are a lot of fountain pens, too, if you're not into ones that you have to fill with ink and even use cartridges with, there is actually a number of brands out there, very popular ones that have fountain pens. So it's like the nib, the feed, the whole deal, but it's all self-contained and it's disposable. You know, Zebra makes them as well in a lot of different colors. I don't use them all the time, though, because I have other fountain pens. And actually, that's a big reason why I don't use those is because I know that once they're gone, I'm throwing them away. I'm not like a big, like, save the environment person but i'm also not like a destroy the environment person when it comes to that happy medium (laughs) exactly yeah don't come for me on either end of that spectrum but what i do (laughs) like about the fountain pens is that you are refilling them and you're reusing them and even with the cartridges just like i said you know it is a little piece of plastic and most of the time when you're done you throw that out probably less plastic than like a full pen i guess you would get rid of but there still is waste you know when you come along with it so it's not completely like eco-friendly save the world type of approach to it but there definitely is some environmental benefits to it from a standpoint of not throwing that pen inside of the trash i'm sure someone will say that there's not environmental benefits to digging up pigments as well and then you know natural resources but let's move on to your next question 
before we get ourselves in trouble. So this one is going to be hard to explain because I feel like it's it's both ends of a spectrum because I both assume that a fountain pen is less comfortable in the hand, but then also more comfortable in the hand. And by this, I kind of mean like, I look at a fountain pen, I'm like, you're so chunky. I feel like it would be like writing with a crayon as a three-year-old where they're just like not made for your hand size. <laughs> But mm-hmm. then I can also understand how uncomfortable a super thin pen can be. So I assume there's nuance to it. I just am too beginner to know what the nuance is. That's actually a, a really good assumption to have because every pen and certain brands make them to kind of fit a certain niche. So if you're the type of person that likes like a very thin you know, minuscule kind of pencil. There are fountain pens out there that are very teeny tiny, um, especially like old vintage ones. And this, again, I'm I'm sharing this as, oh, just putting this out here, not my belief. But if you go to like pen shows, they'll have some vintage pens that are like a fountain pen for the ladies. And it's like a very thin, skinny, little like metal pen that you can put inside of your purse. Those are very small and very tiny. Those feel like you're writing with like the little tiny itty bitty pencil and you're just like scratching across the paper, right? Then there are kind of your normal everyday, like even the one that I was saying that I'm using today, um, it just feels like holding any type of pen inside of your hand. There are some that like one of my favorites, I actually bought this one for my girls. It's actually one that I'm recommending for you later as a great introduction pen is one from Pelican. It's called the Twist. And what's cool about it is actually made for good hand positioning when holding a fountain pen. So you actually can't hold the pen wrong because it's literally designed to kind of fit in your hands as you use it. Now I say that Last weekend, we were out and the waitress was writing with uh, her pinky, her thumb and her ring finger, like on a piece of paper. So like, if that's a way that you like to write, then it might not be the pen for you. But like, she was writing very, very, uh, I know, try it. Like this? Like this. Uh, you can't see us on the podcast, but both of us look <laughs> like idiots right now trying to hold a pen as if, I don't know. Which I actually forgot to ask you this question. And this is... um I mean, to like generalize because I know that you're not like in Europe, right? But a lot of people that are like in Europe, I think a lot of people from Germany, I think a handful of people from the UK have let me know that they were forced to use fountain pens in grade school when learning how to write. You grew up in Australia, right? Not New Zealand. You live in New Zealand, but you grew up in Australia. Yeah, no, we were not forced to use fountain pens. We had a like a school camp where we went and got to use fountain pens, but that was something special. That wasn't an everyday. Like we learned how to do cursive and then eventually you got your pen license. Like, you know, you've proven what? to the teacher that you can actually write like a person, not like a gremlin. So you can have this official piece of official quote quote piece of paper that says, yes, I am allowed to use a pen now. I don't think I ever got mine. So I'm, I'm out here doing illegal moves. I love that idea. How cool would that be to be like, you have to pass this pen writing test to get your pen license. You're going to bring that stamp out. <laughs> yeah. And you have to renew it every few years to make sure that you're still writing okay. Yeah. Make sure that you're not writing hateful things. That's what it is. And I'm sure the ones that you know kids were using way back in the day were not made for their hands. They were probably your standard issue, whatever. But there's definitely pens you can get that are more comfortable. You can get some that have like a rubbery or spongy grip. You can really kind of go all over the place with it. I would say for the most part, you can find a pen that's comfortable in your hand. You have to try though. Go to a pen show. You can try before you buy. I do like the idea that you can kind of pick and choose with what kind of works for you. And I suppose that another assumption that I have, which is kind of related to that, would be that you have a lot more flexibility, I assume, in terms of ink color because obviously you've got a bunch of different ink brands and such but then I, s- I assume you possibly could mix them I assume there's also then uh things you might need to consider with that like the type of ink or what it's made with and whether they would actually mix properly I'm very much thinking like oil and water here I know that oh, yeah. most people don't write with oil and or water but I mean there are some people on Instagram that fill their fountain pen with water write with it and then like dip ink into it to like watch it do its thing. It's very magical. I'll have to send you the reel because I'm obsessed with those videos. I went from having one bottle of ink and I actually had cataloged all of my inks because I have so many. And also I want to have a digital catalog and I cataloged all my pens too. I have a whole video on that as well. But um, I went from having one bottle of ink and now I have 80 bottles of ink. And <laughs> I, will, I will never use every ounce of ink 
that I have in these. I know it. I'm not going to, but I like to have options. No, I completely understand. The same idea with me and my notebooks. Like by the time that this comes out, the giveaway that we're running is already done. But I did a count up of the number of just A5 notebooks that I have that aren't used. And that doesn't include any of the travelers or the square or the basics or the A6 or anything. Just A5, not yet used, like haven't put any ink in it. I have 91 journals. I'm not going to use those. I I mean, if I was going to, if I was just sticking with them, it would take me like 20 years to use all of those. I have in my collection one more A5 than you do. I counted all of mine (gasps) up. I have 92. Scandal. I need another notebook. (laughs) Well, the only reason is I just got the Archer and Olive subscription box and there was one in there. So I I don't actively buy any more A5s because last time I did my count and I had that many, I was like, Mark, you have a problem. You have a problem. I did mine. I said exactly the same thing. I'm like, Jessica, stop. And then the little like devil on my other shoulder was like, but you like square journals, Mark. You should buy more square journals. So now I just buy square journals. I know it's 100% a problem because I've obviously built out my rainbow, like we can see, my rainbow of notebooks. And I was like, okay, we've got them in the A5s now. So now we're going to start building a rainbow in every other color. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) I mean, it's a fun project for absolute sure. And in that respect, I can kind of understand where people get into like, you know, collecting their inks, collecting their fountain pens, because obviously I have a collection. I collect two things. One is notebooks and the other one is pictures of card number plates like the ones that people have customized themselves that are kind of fun and quirky. That one's a lot cheaper though. Oh, license plates. <laughs> license no- plates. They call number plates here. Do you not have letters on yours? Yeah, now as I think about it, there are definitely letters. That's a really odd name for them, but eh. Registration plates? That's not right either. <laughs> no, license plates. But no, I like number plates. Look, there's a lot of stuff that probably makes sense to you. I think the always one is like, where do you park your car? And you're like, in a driveway, you're like, no, in the car park. Oh, yeah. A car hold. Or a car hold. Yeah, you, we call it very different things. I've never seen your number plate collection. Now I want to see your number plate collection. I, but I thought that was going to finish out. I've never seen your number plate. I'm like, you never will, you creeper. <laughs> <laughs> Stop being weird. Let's get back to talking about stationery and pens and notebooks. This one is less of an assumption and more of a thing that I feel like I know to be true. So it's going to be really awkward if you tell me it's not. But I do not think that they work in all journals. Yeah, that's true. And they're also very finicky. So I did a video where I tried a bunch of fountain pens in Archer and Olive journals because people used to say to me all the time, Mark, I can't use fountain pens because I use Archer and Olive journals. I'm like, well, that's not true. I've been using fountain pens for years in mine. But what turns out is that there are different types of pens and different types of inks. And sometimes certain types of inks don't work well in certain types of pens inside of certain types of journals, if that's not confusing enough. So over time, essentially what you do is you're like, okay, I have this fountain pen ink in this pen and you'll write with it in a journal and it'll like bleed through the page or it'll feather or write or or do whatever. And you're like, okay, that sucks. Well, I'm never using that again, obviously. And then you forget, I'm sorry, I'm speaking from personal experience here. You forget that either one of those things didn't work and then you put a different ink in the pen and then it works really nice. But it really does come down to the different types of pen and the different types of inks that you're using. I would say that one of the big things, especially for Archer and Olive notebooks, and I would say this is true for a lot of them, is that you don't want to go with like a really broad nib. So like there's different levels of nibs that I'll go through in just a little bit when I talk about like things to look out for when you're when you're buying pens. So you've got like your extra fine and fine, which are you know very thin. It's kind of like your 0.38, you know, very little regular pen, right? I don't mean it like that, like oh, your little regular pen, but you know, a regular gel pen. And then you get broader and broader. And then you get to like the, you know, the one millimeters and three millimeters and even bigger. And that's kind of what those nibs do as well. And the whole idea with that is the larger the nib is, the more ink that you're putting down on your page. So, you know, you can use a certain pen and ink inside of your journal may find but that you like up the nib size. And then suddenly you have problems because the paper is like, not today, mister, we are not dealing with this. Go back to your little baby thin pens. I think that the last one isn't so much an assumption, but more so something that possibly intimidates me about fountain pens. Maybe that's why I'm not as into it as others, but there's just so many different components that you can kind of like tweak or change or do differently. Like you've said, uh, like nib sizes. Uh, what and then the barrel and then all of the other different parts and then I have to pink an ink color and then I have to consider paper maybe like 
it just feels like a lot of thought that needs to be done. <laughs> for me personally, and I think for a lot of other people that like fountain pens, that's kind of the fun part about it, right? Is trying different pens, seeing what you like, collecting different inks, and kind of going through there. What I was thinking I could do, maybe this is a really good point, is I'm going to basically prove your point correct. And maybe we can talk about just things to consider with your pens, because there are a lot of options. There's no doubt about it whatsoever. There are a ton of options. But I think if you're aware of what they are, maybe it feels a little bit less nervous. You're less nervous about it or like less like not interested in kind of going into it or anxious about it. But let me know as we go through. If you're like, what in the hell are you talking about, Mark? This is exactly why I will never do this. Then I'll just stop it because there's a lot we can kind of go into here for sure. I think it's one of those, like, it's, it's a combination of build a bear and you don't know what you don't know. So it's like there are a whole bunch of different pieces that you can pick and choose from, but I don't know what any of the pieces are. So please enlighten me. Yeah. So let's go ahead and start with the nib first, because this is one of those those things that you pick as you go through most of the pens at least the ones that i get you don't really replace the nib there are some pens however where you can so like for instance my first pen that lami that i got my sister-in-law got that for me in a medium nib which is you know middle of the road it's not super thin but it's not very thick and at that point instead of my bullet journal i was only using like 0.28 and 0.38 millimeter pens so this looked like ultra bold on my page and so i went online and i was like i don't know about this i didn't know anything about it but like lami for instance sells the nibs and you can replace the nib you just literally pop it off and then you put on the extra fine or fine nib and you can still write with it that way but there are a lot of different sizes and i've mentioned them a handful of times that we've gone through the technical term for it even though i haven't heard a lot of people call it this is called the grinds is what it's called because they are made out of metal there are people out there that will custom grind your pen nib for you which is really awesome i think it's really cool i've never had it done because i'm cheap you go out and you're like okay what does this look like so most of the nibs are going to kind of have like a sphere on the end you could probably if you ever look at the bottom of any type of kind of pointed pen you will see that if it's kind of that circle or whatever that looks like think about like a ballpoint pen for instance right it's the ink that's coming out of there right and it's just kind of like moving the ink around on your page and so there's different sizes of the nib so they start with something the smallest I've ever seen is kind of like an, an EF, which is extra fine. There is also another one called an XF, which is always very interesting to me. It kind of looks like a needle point instead of like a regular pen nib. And I always love the way that they look. And I have a few in my collection. And then you have the fine, which is like a little bit of a step up. Honestly, a lot of the times I don't notice a huge difference between like an extra fine and a fine. And then you have medium, which is kind of, I would say, probably run of the road, like 0.8 millimeter ish and that kind of say 0.7 i guess if i'm relating it to that you have broad which then goes into like the boulder uh you have stub nibs which uh look totally different like a lot of the stub nibs are like big huge thick you use them for titles essentially or my my wife's uh uncle says you get a stub nib because that's what you sign your name in it's just a it's a it's a statement what you use like a broad nib for sure and then you can go into like italic and cursive nibs and parallel nibs, but I haven't ventured down there just yet. They have nibs to specifically write italicized. Mm -hmm. I actually just at, today, I got another pen order in where I ordered a medium italic nib. No idea what it does just yet, but I was like, I don't have that in my collection, so I'm going to buy it. Nah, because my, my natural handwriting tends to be italicized. I don't typically use my natural handwriting in my journal. Like, I write everything in all caps, kind of like you do. When I first started, it was a very strange concept because it is not what I'm you know used to. So the idea of having a pen specifically designed to write italicized is intriguing to me. <laughs> it's interesting, and they don't give you a pen license to write in all caps. You definitely need to get a different certification for that after you graduate from school. The cool thing about all of these nibs is that you, for the most part, right, probably, I don't know, I'll see what happens with this italic one that I bought. I'm just going to write normal with it. My normal, regular, all caps handwriting, all of those nibs that I mentioned there, you can use that way. Now, the materials that they're made with, though, are what kind of add some of those variances inside of there. Like I said, there are a few out there that are just made with different types of, you know, stainless steel, um, there's like German made steel versus like other types of steel. There's titanium. Uh, I always say it wrong, but palladium is another one that's out there. That one is like a very 
bright white. It gives the look of platinum, but it's for the frugal people out there that don't want to spend a lot of that money. <laughs> the gold nibs like we talked about. And there's some out there that are called flex nibs. And those are the ones that look like those calligraphy nibs where if you press a little bit harder, you know, the tip of it will like spread a little bit. What did you call it? I would say like open leg, but that's not what I'm thinking about. Red eagle pin. <laughs> what was that? You're on a Mac, aren't you? I am. What just happened? A balloon just went off. I think it's when you do a peace sign. It does like balloons or something, or it's a thumbs up or one of the two. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, that's never happened to me before, I swear. <laughs> Obviously, there's not a lot of things to thumbs up or peace about. <laughs> <laughs> Except when we're talking about spread it like this. <laughs> Yeah, it's a party now. <laughs> if you're on, if you're watching us on the video podcast right now, both Jess's and my face are probably beat red. Yeah, and we're crying right now from <laughs> what I thought you said earlier about your nib, which was not correct. I don't even remember. <laughs> I probably said spread eagle. That sounds like what that's I what say. it was. That's <laughs> the same. That means the same thing here. So I know. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> okay oh my gosh oh my gosh i hope this is an okay tissue here we go cry cry oh god i hope it's an okay tissue too <laughs> i was just sitting out on the bench so i'm like i probably use this to clean a ruler i'll just like end up with black smudges on me uh, but anyway so if you press too hard your nib will go spread eagle and you'll get uh thicks and thins on your page so <laughs> there's that let's go ahead and move away from this topic now <laughs> All right, so moving on from that, because I will never think about my nibs the same way ever again. The other kind of thing to think about, too, is the feed. Now, this isn't something that I've actually come across a lot because I don't actually pay a lot of attention to this, but it's the feed. So the feed is literally what it is. It's feeding the nib of your pen, whether it's spread eagle or not, with as much ink as possible. No, it's, it's kind of making sure it's going through. That idea of the fountain pen always being available. Um, some of them are made out of plastic. I honestly feel like most of them are probably made out of plastic. Um, I have seen some that are made out of rubber, and those are probably some older ones. And probably the reason that we've done away with those is because after a while, they can dry rot, right? And you have to replace them. And replacing anything in a fountain pen, it's a part of the maintenance. It will happen sometimes. That That's a messy thing to have to do. Um, we already talked about the grip, um, but something to pay attention to for sure, depending on how you want your pen to feel in your hand, it does make a really big difference. I've written with pens that I hate holding in my hand. I think that they just, they hurt. Like they are not comfortable and nobody wants to use a pen like that. I always find that after I've written quite a lot because of the way that I hold my pen and I hold it quite like vice grip, I have a, a kind of, is it a knuckle? Yeah, it's a knuckle that has like a little kind of like like a callus on it. A callus. And it's, it's after I've been writing for a long time, the callus is just like, angry face. Why did you do this to me? I do worry, I suppose, with the way that I hold a pen. Because I know it's not what you're necessarily taught in school in terms of holding it. Because I rest the barrel of my pen against what would be like your right hand ring finger. And that's not necessarily typical. A lot of people will hold it so that it's resting against your middle finger. I guess it would be kind of like finding a grip that that still feels comfortable to have that many kind of fingers around the barrel of the pen without it being like, I don't know, awkward or weird. Oh, so you're only one finger away from my waitress. Yeah, exactly. We're, we're, we're <laughs> closely related. <laughs> that was bad. Okay, I don't think I can make any further jokes about this, so let's talk about the barrel. <laughs> the barrel of the pen, honestly, this is something to pay attention to because, well, gosh, here we go. There's sometimes they're shorter, sometimes they're longer, and you have to find what feels right in your hand. <laughs> Who knew that fountain pen talk could be so phallic? <laughs> like... Maybe that's probably why these were created. People are like, did you see that guy's pen? pretty yeah. chunky pen it's like oh that's got a good stroke to it like uh. <laughs> okay. exactly so but the barrel overall i think a lot of the time I mean, the barrel really is what holds everything so like if you have a converter it sits inside of there if it's your cartridge it sits inside of there but really the barrel honestly like that's the material that it's made out of right that's kind of what you see the most because it's for the most part the longer part of the pen and what you're doing what is 
interesting about the shorter barrels, so there's things called pocket pens out there that are small. It's kind of like what I was talking about before, like the pen made for the ladies. Really what those are, are just kind of a shorter barrel. And then you have to post, which is another term to use. Posting is when you take the cap and sit it on the back of your pen, right? And so by posting that, it then makes it a full-size pen. There are definitely different types of caps as you go into that too and like how they connect there's the ones you know like the platinum one that i have and like most pens too they're just the slip on they just you put them on there you write with it you pull it off you put your cap back on the same way you do for any type of capped ballpoint pen that you would use same exact kind of thing there there are other ones too that have like a twist inside of them those would be called like threaded caps is would be the name of them is what you would call them but what the deal with that is is like to close your pen you have to put the cap on it and then you have to twist it a few times right and then it holds it nice and secure those i find really great especially if you're traveling with pens and if you're ever nervous about a pen cap coming off and getting on your clothes or in your pocket or like in your luggage or something like those are really good to have but the problem is is that when you post those some of the pens have the threads on the back end of it so you're literally like unthreading it to take the cap off, rethreading it to put the cap on the back. And then if you're like, okay, I'm done with writing for right now, you have to go through that process again. And it's just a lot. Yeah, it's it's a lot and no one likes to do that. But if you really like your pen, you put up with it. I like that there are actually benefits to having the threaded ones because in my mind, I'd be like, oh, how inconvenient. Like I have to screw top my pen to actually write anything. But like you said, with travel and if you want to store it like in your pocket while you're walking around and everything, you just want to make sure that you're safeguarding your pants from any mishaps. Like it makes a lot of sense. But also if you're the type of person that loses caps of pens, it's one thing if you lose a cap on a ball point pen you're like whatever throw it in your bag not a big deal but you can't lose the cap of your fountain pen because well it'll dry out but also on top of that you have to worry about it getting on things as well because again that feed is continuously feeding ink so if that's touching your clothes if that's touching any type of fabric it's literally just over time just dying (laughs) whatever it is that's there so definitely i prefer the slip on the slip offs just for easy writing it works really well i don't mind a threaded cap i have a few of them but i know what i'm getting into when i choose that pen i know that it's going to be a little bit more of a pain in the butt than the others are but i deal with it because i like the pen i know you said you don't have to worry about a ballpoint but you totally do depending on where you're storing it i had tied my hair back once put a pen in the back of it because i was just like doing something with my hands i need this out of the way forgot that it was there and then put my hoodie on and then went about my day walking around doing whatever got home and the pen had drawn scribbles all through the back of my one hoodie that is not black Oh my god, I was gonna say what color is your hoodie because yeah, like, that everything in my wardrobe is black except for this one hoodie, which now has big scribbles all through the hood of it. I'm like, oh, that's a nice decorative piece that you added there, Jessica. Well, that's your artsy hoodie now. You know, when you're yeah. gonna do like art, you put on yeah. that artsy hoodie. <laughs> that's right. Don't stifle my creativity. Leave my scribble alone, she said to herself. <laughs> So the other thing that we're going to chat about too, we talked about like the ink and things like that. How you get the ink into the pen is something you definitely have to think about. I think the nib is a really big deal, obviously, because that's what you're writing with. That's what it's going to give you the comfortability, the lines, kind of all of those things. The way in which you fill your pen, the the ink filling mechanism though, it's very interesting. It's very cool. And I actually have all of these because I was like, I have to try that. So the first one we talked about was the converter cartridge, right? Or cartridge converter. I use those words together. But essentially, you're either putting a converter into the top of your pen and you're sucking ink up into it, or it's a cartridge that goes onto there that has the ink already inside of it. So we've talked about that a ton. The other one which I really love, and this is actually... Well, a lot of converters are these. They're called piston fills. And so essentially what that is, is there's this little tiny piston that's inside that you lower and then you bring it back up. And it kind of creates that suction, right, is what you're doing with that piston to get the ink into your pen. Uh, There's a lot of different ways to do this. So there are some that are just extra on the side. So like I actually have a whole lot of these just around because whenever you buy a pen, usually they'll come with cartridges or a converter because they give you options. Some pens are actually made with it built in. So the Twisbees that I talked about before, there are some from Pilot. I think almost every major brand has pens like this where it's built in. And all you do is you stick the top of your pen into your ink and just on the back side of the pen, like 
where before you put the cap on top of it, you twist it and then there's a piston inside that goes up and down depending on however much ink you want to put inside of there. So is that done without having to like unscrew the barrel or is that like you take things out of the barrel and then you pull it and then you put it back in? The converter is the barrel. Oh. So it's all built in. So you never have to take anything apart with that type of a pen. I don't want to say you never have to take anything apart. Because if you're doing a thorough cleaning, you will usually take your pen apart to get like really, really cleaned out. But you don't have to. You can just do like a flush is what I call it, which is just, you know, sucking ink and pushing it back out with water instead of ink. Those are just really great. Those are all in ones. I actually recommend one of them for you that we'll get into next. And it's just because it's so easy. The ma- There's no real maintenance with it because you're just using everything that's already inside of there. The other really cool one, this one visually looks cool. I find it to be a little pain in the butt. So it's called a vacuum filling system. So this is like a piston, but it has this really cool action that basically turns your pen into a vacuum to suck the ink up inside of it. So usually there's like a plunger mechanism that happens with these essentially so you would so you unscrew the top and you pull it up and then what you do is you press it down and when it gets to a certain part there's a little gap in the pen and basically it goes past it and it creates a vacuum and it just sucks the ink right up inside of your pen Uh, if you're watching on youtube or if you watch on the video podcast i'll go ahead and like overlay it over this part so you can see it so if anything you know come to this part of the podcast but that just looks so cool but the problem is is you can't always fill that all the way and sometimes you're there like two or three times you're like nope it's never gonna fill past here i'm done with it but it looks very cool and i have to say that like of all of my pens that i fill I always thoroughly enjoy it. Always make reels out of that when I feel that pen because it's a moment. Then the last one that's out there, it's called like aromatic. Sometimes it's called a bladder filled pen. (laughs) And essentially what it is, and I have one, but I haven't used it yet. It's essentially like a small rubber bladder that's inside of your pen that you basically have to like press and then like you let go and like it sucks up. So, you know, if you're squeezing your bladder, things are going to come out. I don't know what the op, I've never seen anyone do the reverse of a human bladder, but essentially your fountain pen can do that. And that's how you get the ink into there. But the problem with those is that usually they're made out of rubber or some other type of material that over time will need to be replaced or could potentially fail on you. So I have one that's a Mark Twain is what it's called. It's a really cool looking pen. Again, I'll overlay it on the video here if you haven't seen it before, but it has a really cool mechanism to it. But the way in which you fill it is using that bladder. Sometimes it's made out of plastic too. I think that's what mine's made out of. More modern ones are made out of plastic. Okay, so it's like a plastic sack that's kind of attached to the yeah there we go so it's like a plastic kind of chamber that's attached to the nib and then you press it down to like push out any of the air and then you put Mm -hmm. it into the ink and release it and then it Mm -hmm. as it expands pulls the ink into it were you a were you a science teacher at some point in your life because i'm sitting here thinking like oh yeah like titrations like when you're trying to like get a a particular aliquot of whatever you're doing and stuff like i don't know what we call them i just call them the bulb because it's effectively like a bulb that you evacuate the air out of it you put it on the end of your pipette and then you release it and it sucks things up into the barrel of the pipette when you were going through it i was just like i I know what this is i understand kind of (laughs) yeah see so there's a lot of very cool ways that you can do it but uh, there's a lot of different things to look into do you have any questions about any of those things i feel like i talked for a really long time about (laughs) all the different pieces of something most people probably heads are spinning right now eyes have rolled back (laughs) hopefully they're not driving (laughs) while listening to this podcast um (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but anything in there that was interesting, minus the bladder conversation and obviously the very weird place we went with the nibs. So there's obviously a lot of things that you can consider, and you're going to give me some examples of maybe newbie-friendly ones, which I'm excited for. But with all of these different I don't know, pieces that you can be considering, the different materials, the different styles of nib and ways to fill the pen and all of that, what kind of price range are we thinking when it comes to pens? Because I know we kind of touched on the idea that it doesn't have to be expensive. What kind of a range are you looking at when you're looking at your fountain pens? So for me personally, I think it, once you get into this space, you're looking at spending anywhere between $5 for some inexpensive pens, but still good quality. And I would say probably up to like 65 or $70 is usually where I personally stop myself. There may be like a really special one where I'll be like, okay, this is 
this means something to me or there's a material or it has a meaning to it. There are some really cool pens um, from Bennu is the name of it. They have like these themes of things. So um, if you're into like talismans or things like that, they actually have a whole collection where they're resin pens and inside the resin are pieces of materials, flowers, tiger's eye, things like that that are really cool that you could kind of get into there. And those tend to be a little bit more expensive. And for that, I'll say I'll treat myself. But I would say most of the time between five and like $65 dollars high end i think you can stay with in and it'll still give you a really good quality pen with some special features that that you might like because then i suppose you also have all of the other one of like pen paraphernalia like your little like pen stands and your little ink stands and all of that kind of thing your like dedicated swatch book for all of your inks <laughs> Yeah, thank you for minimizing uh, my stands and my holders. Do you have one that's like a crab? Oh, I have a pen holder that's a crab. I love that. Oh, this is my favorite. My octopus. Oh, that's pretty. The pen paraphernalia world is intense. We have a lot of pen friends. Maybe like we can have like a pen friend on for like one of the episodes because after this i feel like you're gonna be like mark i love fountain pens let's talk about this more yeah you need to have somebody here to like support you in your enthusiasm while i'm just like but this but that i'm a nelly naysayer wah 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 well let's go ahead and let me share some of these pens with you that i feel like we should get into your hands at some point i think a lot of these are going to kind of fit your needs i think it will fit your hands one of them specifically that i've mentioned and also your personality and that's kind of a big thing that i like to really pick when I'm choosing a pen is funny the one that fits my personality in some way. So the first one is the one that I've mentioned before, which is the Platinum Preppy pen, because this is a $6 pen. It gives you everything you need to get started. Most of the time, these are going to come with a cartridge. They come with one already, and they're inexpensive to purchase. So they're not really that big deal. There's kind of very low effort. Now, if you wanted to turn this into a reusable pen, you can do that and make it into an eyedropper pen, but you need a lot of other materials, but we're not going to go there. $6, Platinum Preppy, get one. They write great, and they work wonderfully. The second one I would recommend to you, I mentioned as well, was the Pelican Twist. So that pen's about $26, so it's kind of that mid-range one, but that's the one that has the twist on it on the handle. It's also somewhat rubberized, so it's very comfortable to use, and it really forms to your hand. Now, I don't know for someone who writes differently than everyone else with your other fingers like you talked about there, but you should try it, I feel like, anyway, um, and get that. The guy I talked to at Pelican at one of the shows was like, you want to get your girls into fountain pens? Here's a really easy one to use, and it worked out wonderfully. And you can get ones in sparkly colors and different colors, too. So there's a lot of different options. All right, so the next one I'm going to tell you about, I feel like you would like because it's a little silly. So these are called Pilot Kakuno pens. They're about $14. The reason that I have this pen is that on the nib of the pen, there are little faces that are etched onto the nib. Aww, like happy faces or just like just generally different ones for different pens from that brand? or Yeah, so like literally... Literally, the ones that just came out, they are a family of pens. So you have one of the pens has a little face on it with a bow tie. Oh. One is like a baby with a little pacifier in its mouth. <laughs> and then there's like other ones too. Again, I'll put them up on screen so you can just see them because I can't show you because, you know, it's like a, you have to have a product photo to really see what they look like. But I like these because they are cartridges as well. I feel like honestly getting a, a pen with a cartridge is going to be your best entry point into fountain pens because that'll kind of give you the feeling for it. They are comfortable. They're made out of plastic. I guess technically maybe they're resin, but they feel like plastic. Uh, but they also come in a lot of different colors and they're transparent. So you can see the ink inside of there too. And that's something else that you will see if you start looking down this like if you see anything that's called like a demonstrator pen that's usually a clear pen so when you fill it with ink you can see the ink color while you're writing with it it's like a little x-ray of your pen and it's very cool looking and then the last one i'm going to recommend to you these are my absolute favorite pens so they're called twisby echo so it's twisby it's spelled weird t-w-s-b-i and then echo e-c-o these pens range about 35 dollars and they come literally in a rainbow of colors. I also love them because they're the type of pen that has the converter already built into it. So where you twist the top to suck the ink into it and you twist it the other way that pushes the ink out or when you're cleaning it. But really more than anything just is all the different colors that exist out there. And you can get into a real deep rabbit hole with those. But I think the Twisby Echo is good because it's priced affordably. And if you just buy yourself an ink, you can just buy one, you just keep refilling it. So very little maintenance inside of those pens. I, I could go down a lot more, but 
But I think of all of the pens, like those four are definitely like the best place for you to start with because they're easy, affordable, and honestly come in a lot of different like fun little variations enough to make you know your personality shine amongst all of your other friends. I will say that your enthusiasm is kind of rubbing off on me. So I kind of feel like I might have to at least try one and possibly one of the ones that you actually recommended because it seems like a reasonable place to start. Like you handpicked these for me. I appreciate that effort. So I'm going to put all of those in the description box or in the show notes so that if you guys want to get your hands on any of those pens, then they are linked down there. Mark, where is your favorite place to shop for fountain pen anything? Ooh, so this is a really good question. So I personally am a big fan of Atlas Stationers. So if you're in the US, they're my favorite. They have a really great, strong presence on social media, first of all, and I really appreciate that. Like when a pen company is making funny reels, I'm all about that. They're a family owned company. I'm actually an affiliate through them as well. Um, and that I've just had a really good relationship with them. I kind of look at like, they're like my pen dealer. And then like Archer and Olive is my notebook dealer. And I work with a lot of other brands and companies too. So it's not like there, but they just have a really large variety of different types of pens. They're really great. Um, another company too, I purchased a handful of things from there, but Goulet Pen is another one that has a really strong presence, a lot of great education. And those two guys are just, they're fantastic and they really know all of their stuff. So there's kind of different ways you can look at it, but those two are kind of like my favorites for a lot of the education. And except a new pens come out, they're talking about them. So you can kind of do a lot. And we also have a lot of pen friends as well that are like really into it. So like you and I are big friends with Julia and she is really kind of digging deeper into that space too. She makes a lot of great videos too. We'll put a link to her stuff in the in the descriptions too, so you can check her stuff out. But she's dealing with pens and inks. And honestly, she's like my pen influencer too. She'll be like, Mark, I have this pen. I love it. It's amazing. I'm like, well, great. Now I have to have it. Thanks a lot. <laughs> influencer indeed. Well, it's good to know that we have some starting points for where we can either go shopping for some uh, fountain pen related things or some people we can check out to get some influence or excitement around fountain pens. But do you have a question for the Planner Pals regarding? fountain pens? Absolutely. So the question for this week, which we would love our planner pals to answer, is that if you have used fountain pens before, whether you are a fountain pen aficionado and have used so many, have a beautiful collection, or maybe you have slightly dipped your toe into there, the question for this week is going to be, what pen would you recommend to someone who hasn't tried fountain pens before? If you'd like to answer that question, you can shoot us an email Planner Pals Podcast at gmail.com. We can also check us out over at Planner Pals Podcast on Instagram or drop your recommendation in the comment section below if you're listening to us or watching us on YouTube. While Mark is notably very excited about fountain pens, something I'm excited about, and I hope that he is too, is that coming up very soon, we are both going to be together at Go Wild. It was Absolutely awesome getting to meet you in person last year, even if it was just for a little bit. So I'm glad that you're going to be sticking around a little bit longer this time. We actually get to spend the majority of the weekend together and other people, of course. Yeah. And also what I'm really excited about is that I'm actually going to be hosting the crop, which if you're unfamiliar with that, I'm going to be working along with Zebra and we're going to be doing a workshop on Friday night. And I haven't done it before and I don't know what to experience. So as much as I know right now about what I'm doing for this workshop, Jess, I'm going to need a lot of your help to like help us understand the full experience of Go Wild because I've seen pictures. I was there for like, I don't know, an hour or two and I it was during a break. So I have no idea what happens. So I can't wait to hear more about it and share what we're going to be doing there, which it will not be recording a podcast. I know a number of people ask us that. We are not mature enough for that just yet. This episode, I think, is clearly who knows what would happen if we were live. We would have we would get put in jail, I'm sure. We would offend somebody. Yep. Cancelled on the internet indeed. So we will not be recording a live podcast while we're there at Go Wild, but I am very excited to actually get to see people in person. If you're gonna be there, you make sure you let us know. But on our next episode, we're gonna be talking about both my personal point of view view of Go Wild since I've been there once and Mark's kind of point of view given the fact that he hasn't actually attended before. So stay tuned. We will see you in our next episode. And from your two true planner pals, thank you for watching.